Revolutionary War on Wednesday. Magic Tea House, Book Number Twenty Two, Chapter One, Wednesday. Wake up, Jack! Annie whispered. Jack opened his eyes. He looked at his clock. It was six a.m. Come on, Annie whispered. She was standing at his bedroom door, already dressed. Now, said Jack. Yeah, it's Wednesday. We have to go to the tea house, she said. Oh man, Wednesday, said Jack. Suddenly he was wide awake. We have to help save Camelot," said Annie. "I know, I know," said Jack, scrambling out of bed. "Meet you at front," said Annie. Jack quickly changed into his jeans and T-shirt. He threw his notebook and pencil into his pack. Then he slipped down the stairs and out the front door. Annie was waiting in the gray early light. "All set?" she whispered. "Yup," said Jack. They took off running across their yard. They ran down their cross street and into the Far Creek woods. Soon they came to the tea house. They climbed up the rope ladder. In the early light, they saw Morgan's note, the same note they'd found on Sunday. Jack picked it up and read aloud: "Dear Jack and Annie, Camelot is in trouble. To save the kingdom, please find these four special kinds of writing for my library: something to follow, something to send, something to learn, something to lend." Thank you, Morgan. Annie picked up a piece of paper lying on the floor. It was a list of rules from the famous nurse Clara Barton. They had met her on the journey to the Civil War. On Sunday, we found the first special writing," said Annie. "Something to follow." "Yeah," said Jack. "And now we need to find the second thing, something to send." He picked up a book lying near the note. The cover showed soldiers on a snowy riverbank. The title was "The Revolutionary War." Jack frowned. "Uh oh," said Annie. "Another war," said Jack, signing. "You still want to go?" said Annie. "We have to," said Jack. He hated the suffering he'd seen in the Civil War, but they had no choice. They had to help Morgan and save Camelot. He pointed at the cover of the book. I wish we could go there," Jack said. The wind started to blow. The tree house started to spin. It spun faster and faster. Then everything was still, absolutely still. Chapter two, day or night. Jack shivered. The wind blew hard. It's cold," he said. He could see his breath in the air. Wrap your scarf tighter," said Annie. Jack looked down. He had a wool scarf around his neck. He was also wearing woolen pants that buttoned at the knees, a coat, and a hat with three corners. On his feet were funny-looking shoes with buckles. In place of his backpack was a leather bag. Annie was wearing a long coat over a long dress. Jack pulled the scarf tighter. Then he looked out the window with Annie. They landed in trees near an icy river. The sky was gray and heavy with clouds. It's almost day or almost night. I can't tell," said Annie. "Yeah, I hope it's almost day," said Jack. "I wonder where we'll find something to send," said Annie. Jack shrugged. First, we have to find the Revolutionary War," he said. He opened the research book. By the gray light, he read: "Over two hundred years ago, the United States was made up of thirteen colonies ruled by Britain." From 1775 until 1782, American patriots fought for independence from Britain. This was called the Revolutionary War. Jack took out his notebook. He wrote, "American patriots fight for independence from Britain." Jack turned to the page. There was a picture of soldiers in red uniforms. He read aloud, "During the Revolutionary War, British soldiers wore red uniforms. For this reason." They were called redcoats. Jack wrote in his notebook, "British equals redcoats." Wow, snow," said Annie. Jack looked up from his writing. Annie was holding her hand out the window. A few snowflakes blew into the tree house. Not much yet," said Jack. "But we better find the special writing soon." "Well, stop reading and come on," said Annie. She buttoned up her coat and started down the ladder. "Okay, okay," said Jack. He packed the research book and his notebook into his bag. Then he followed Annie. When they stepped onto the ground, there were more snow flurries. The sky was growing darker. 
I'm afraid it's almost night instead of day, said Jack. Yeah, said Annie, looking around. Hey, look, people! She pointed up the river. In the misty distance was a campfire. Several men sat around the fire. They all held muskets. Maybe they can help us, said Annie. She started away, but Jack grabbed her. Wait, I think they're soldiers, he said. They have muskets. Remember the muskets from the Civil War? The guns that the soldiers carried. Oh, yeah," said Annie. "They might be redcoats," said Jack. "Let's sneak closer and get a better look at their uniforms." "Quick," said Annie, "before it's too dark to see." Chapter three. It's time. Annie lifted up her long dress and ran to a tree close to the river. Jack held onto his hat and ran after her. They peeked out from behind the tree. More snow flurries whirled in the twilight. Redcoats," whispered Annie. "Can't tell," said Jack. In the flickering firelight, the men didn't seem to be wearing uniforms at all. They wore ragged pants and coats. Some even had their feet wrapped in tattered cloth. "Come on," Annie said. She ran to a tree closer to the river. Jack followed. "This is as close as we should get," he whispered. "But we still can't tell what they're wearing," said Annie. She crept forward and hid behind a scraggly bush. "No closer," Jack whispered. But Annie took off again. She crouched behind a rock. She was only about ten feet from the campfire. But Annie took off again. She crouched behind a rock. She was only about ten feet from the campfire. Oh, brother, she's way too close now. Jack thought, but he took a deep breath and ran to the rock. When he joined Annie, she looked at him and grinned. This is like hide and seek. She whispered. It's not a game, Annie. Jack whispered back. It's work. Be serious. I am serious," said Annie, her voice rising. "Shh," said Jack. But it was too late. One of the men stood up and looked around. "What's the matter, Captain?" Another asked. "I heard something," said the captain. He held up his musket. Jack stopped breathing. "Who's there?" the captain shouted. Jack looked at Annie. She shrugged. "We're caught," she whispered. "Who's there?" the captain shouted again. "Just two kids," Annie answered in a small voice. Come on and show yourselves," the captain said. Jack and Annie stood out from behind the rock. They both held out their hands. "We come in peace," said Annie. In the shadowy twilight, the captain moved toward them. "Who are you?" he asked. "We're Jack and Annie," said Annie. "Why were you spying on us?" he asked. "We weren't spying," said Jack. "We just wanted to know if you were redcoats or patriots." "Which would you like us to be?" the shadowy figure asked. Patriots," said Jack. "We are patriots," the captain said. "Thank goodness," said Annie. The captain smiled. "Where are you from?" he asked. His voice had softened. "We're visiting relatives nearby," Jack said. "Frog Creek, Pennsylvania," said Annie at the same time. "But that's amazing," the captain said. "My farm is in Frog Creek. Where's your farm?" Jack didn't know how to answer. "It's near the Frog Creek woods," said Annie. All farms are near woods," the man said with a laugh. "What?" Just then, someone called from up the river. "It's time, Captain." The captain turned to the other men near the campfire. "It's time," he repeated. The soldiers quickly put out their fire. They stood with their muskets on their shoulders. "Yes, sir," said Jack. "It is nice to see you, children," the captain said. "I was just trying to write a letter to my own son and daughter. I didn't know what to say." "Tell them that you miss them," said Annie. The man smiled, and I do indeed," he said softly. Then he turned and headed up the river bank. His ragged men followed behind. Soon they all disappeared into the cold mist. Jack looked around. The wind was blowing harder. The snow was sticking to the ground. What now? He asked. More than anything, he wanted to go back home. With the soldiers gone, the river bank felt lonely and scary. We still have to find something to send," said Annie. I know," said Jack. "Maybe we should just follow the captain and his men," said Annie. "They might lead us to something." Jack wasn't sure that was a good idea, but he didn't have a better one. "Okay, but let's try not to get caught this time," he said. He and Annie took off through the frozen twilight, following the snowy footprints of the American patriots. Chapter Four: Commander in Chief. Jack and Annie ran along the river bank. The wind whooshed over the cold water. Wet snowflakes hissed in the dark. 
But then Jack heard other sounds. He heard voices, lots of voices. He and Annie soon came upon hundreds and hundreds of soldiers gathered near the dark river. Many carried oil lanterns. The lanterns gave an eerie glow to the snowy twilight. The captain and his men must be here somewhere," said Jack, looking around. Boats like canoes were tied to near the river. Men were leading horses and loading cannons onto the boats. "What are they all doing?" said Annie. Jack pulled out the Revolutionary War book. He read in a whisper, "On Wednesday, December twenty-fifth, seventeen seventy-six. December twenty-fifth. That's Christmas," said Annie. "Today is Christmas." "Cool," said Jack. He started reading again. On Wednesday, December twenty fifth, seventeen seventy six, the patriots were losing the war. Ragged and weary, many were ready to give up. But something began to happen that would turn the war around. About two thousand four hundred American patriots gathered at the west bank of the Delaware River in Pennsylvania. They prepared to cross the river to go on a secret mission. A secret mission? Oh man! said Jack. He started to pull out his notebook. Attention, troops! The commander in chief! A soldier shouted. Jack and Annie saw a man in a dark cape and a three-cornered hat ride up on a white horse. The commander in chief loomed above the crowd of soldiers. His cape flapped in the wind. He sat calmly and with dignity on the back of his horse. Even at a distance, Jack thought the commander in chief looked familiar, very familiar, but he couldn't figure out why. A very dangerous mission lies before you all," the man shouted above the wind. "But I want you to have courage. You must remember the words of Thomas Paine." The commander in chief held up a piece of paper. He read to his men, "These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman." Wow, that's great," whispered Annie, listening to the powerful words. Jack felt his spirits rise too. The harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. The commander in chief read on. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. It is dearness only that gives everything its value. There was a silence, as if everyone was thinking about the words the man had read. Then the soldiers started cheering and clapping. They didn't seem tired at all any more. Now they seemed eager to set out on their mission. The commander in chief saluted his men. He steered his horse toward the river. As the horse moved past them, Jack got a better look at the rider. He gasped. Of course, he thought. He'd seen that face before on Dollar Bill's. Jack grabbed Annie's arm. I know where the commander in chief is. He exclaimed. He's George Washington. Chapter Five. The letter, George Washington, really? Said Annie. Yeah, I think he is. Said Jack. Wow, where'd he go? Said Annie. I want to see him again. Come on. She started toward the river. Wait, don't go far. Said Jack. I just want to make sure it's him. He opened the Revolutionary War book. He found a picture of the boats on the river bank. He read, When General George Washington gathered his troops by the Delaware River. He was commander in chief of the whole American army. The general led the army for six years until America became a free and independent nation. In 1789, he was elected the first president of the United States. Oh man, it is him," said Jack. He pulled out his notebook and wrote, "General George Washington helped America become independent." Hey, where are you writing? Someone asked. Jack looked up. A bearded soldier was pointed at him. Jack shoved the revolutionary book and his notebook into his bag. Nothing, sir, he said. I started walking away. The man shouted after Jack, but Jack ran toward the river and lost himself in a crowd of soldiers. When he looked over his shoulder, he was relieved. The bearded man was nowhere in sight. Stop, young man! Someone shone a lantern right in Jack's face. Jack gasped. It was the captain. I told you to go home, Jack. The captain said sternly. Where's your sister? Jack looked around. Where was Annie? I don't know. He said. Find her at once and go back to her family. The captain ordered. Our secret mission is very important. Children will only get in the way. Yes, sir. 
said Jack. The captain started to leave, but he stopped. I wonder if you could do me a favor, Jack, he asked. Sure, said Jack. The captain pulled out his letter. This is my letter to my children, he said. It's a farewell letter. Would you please take it back with you to Frog Creek? Yes, sir, said Jack. You must only send it if you hear that we have failed in our mission and many patriots were lost, said the captain. Yes, sir, said Jack. The captain handed his letter to Jack. I copied the general speech for my children, the captain said. If anything bad happens to me, I hope those words will give them courage. The captain then turned and disappeared into the crowd. Good luck, Captain, Jack called. He hoped he would never have to send the letter to the man's children. Suddenly, Jack clutched the letter to his chest. Send, he whispered. This letter was the writing they'd been looking for. Something to send. He and Annie could go home now. Their mission was over. Jack shoved the captain's letter into his bag. Now he just had to find Annie. As he looked around, he shivered. Where is she? he muttered. Jack started moving through the crowd, looking for Annie. It was hard to see. The wind was blowing harder. The snow fell faster. Jack started to panic. Annie, he called. As he wove quickly in and out of the crowd, he kept calling for her. None of the soldiers noticed him. They were all too busy. Finally, Jack came to the river. Through the lamp-lit mist, he saw soldiers waiting to get into the boats. Some had already climbed aboard. Jack, came a cry. Jack saw the figure of a small girl. She was sitting in the back of the biggest boat. No way, he whispered. Jack charged down to the boat. He stood at the edge of the water. What are you doing? Jack shouted. This is George Washington's boat, Annie said. It's our big chance to spend time with him. We might not get another one. Jack looked at the other end of the huge boat. Through the mist and falling snow, he saw the commander-in-chief talking to his crew. We can't go with him, said Jack. We'll get in the way of a secret mission. Besides, we have something to send now. What? How? said Annie. A letter. The captain gave me his letter to take back to Frog Creek, said Jack. We're only supposed to send it if something bad happens to the captain. We can go home now. Oh, can't we go a little later? Annie asked. Jack climbed into the boat to pull her out. No, come on, he said, taking her hand. Suddenly, the crew moved to the back of the boat, near Jack and Annie. The men grabbed their oars and started pushing the boat away from the shore. We're taking off, said Annie. No, we have to get out, Jack said to the rowers. But the men were working too hard to pay attention. They were using their oars to hack up the ice at the edge of the river. Excuse me, Jack said in a loud voice. Just then, the boat jolted forward. Jack nearly lost his balance. The boat broke through more ice. Rough waves slashed against its sides. We have to go back, said Jack. Too late, said Annie. They were headed across the Delaware River.